Well, welcome everyone to today's webinar on how COVID-19 has impacted the food and beverage mega trend. After countless hours of research and readings, and thanks to our great partners, we've updated our Glambia Nutritionals Mega Trends for 2021. And today we'll be focusing on the ways in which COVID, the COVID-19 pandemic has impacted these mega trends. So for anyone who attended last year's mega trends webinar, this should look quite familiar to you. These are the mega trends and then the mini trends that we presented last year. Uh, but for 2021, we, we realized that our mega trends and our mini trends have not necessarily changed, but the way in which consumers experience and then engage with many of them did. So for our Generation Me mega trend, we've actually updated the topic to your COVID experience is not my COVID experience. And that's so we could dig a little bit deeper into the generational differences in terms of pandemic response and then behavior as well. And for the remaining megatrends, we're going to highlight the many trends that we feel have seen the most change over the past year. In building a lifestyle, that'll be clean label and better for you, positively nutritious and functional benefits. In ultra personalization, that'll be ways of eating and convenience. In sustainability matters, it'll be science and tech, full disclosure, hashtag activism and sleuthy shoppers. And then in Sensational, what we'll cover off on Evoke Emotion and the tactile experience. So we'll kick it off with an in-depth look at uh, the variation in pandemic response between each of the generations. The data presented in this section of the presentation comes from Glambia Nutritional's own proprietary COVID consumer tracker, which is a monthly survey that we've been running since the start of lockdown here in the United States. If anyone remembers that, that was over a year ago. Uh, our, our survey covers kind of a slew of behavior and behavioral and attitudinal questions about everything from uh, product consumption and channel purchases to need state occasions, um, grocery spend, food service visitation, exercise and activity, and even more beyond that. Um, but today we'll be looking at a few questions that highlight the different ways in which each generation has been impacted by COVID specifically. Now, the first topic that has come to the forefront of COVID discussions is immunity and the importance of immune system support. So we asked consumers, how important was immune system support to you before COVID-19? How important is it to you now? And then how important will it be to you in the future? And all respondents clearly indicate that the importance of immune system support has increased substantially since before COVID-19 hit, um, you know, with that elevated importance continuing on into the future as well. But the most in interesting thing to note here is that even at pre-COVID levels of importance, immune system support is still more important to millennials than any other generation. Now, how do consumers plan on supporting their immune system in the future if it's so important? Well, when, if we index these values against the total response, we see that boomers are more likely to reach for beverages that are fortified with immune system supporting ingredients. Uh, Gen X are more likely to prefer eating foods that are fortified with immune system supporting ingredients. And millennials and Gen Z are more likely to reach for beverages that are naturally high in immune system supporting ingredients, something maybe like an orange juice. Now, when it comes to exercise and activity, we wanted to understand the impact that COVID has had on each generation's exercise frequency. So we asked consumers how many days a week they exercised before COVID and how many days a week are they exercising now? And what we're seeing is that older consumers in the boomer and Gen X generations were and are more likely to be moderately active, exercising one to four days a week with relatively little variation um, in that frequency from pre-COVID to now. Younger consumers, the millennials and the Gen Z cohorts, are more likely to be more active in terms of frequency and also have seen larger shifts to more frequent exercise since pre-COVID than that of their older, their older counterparts. So they're actually exercising maybe a little more frequently compared to pre-COVID. But how are they exercising, you might ask? Well, we asked that too, and this time with a view towards the future. So we know that Many people had to adjust their exercise and workout routine when COVID hit and gyms closed, uh, but how will that behavior change once normal activities resume? Or will it, you might ask? 
Uh, well, when indexing these values against this total response, again, we see that boomers are currently exercising outdoors. Gen X have, uh, are more likely to have downloaded exercise apps. Millennials are going to the gym and Gen Z have started new sports and activities. But once normal activities resume, boomers anticipate that they'll continue exercising outdoors. Uh, Gen X, who were using live stream workout classes during the pandemic, are more likely to continue using live streaming workout classes. And millennials who have started using an exercise app are more likely to continue doing so as well. Gen Z is just going to continue, you know, on with whatever new sport or activity that they picked up during the pandemic. And finally, we want to know what kind of financial impact COVID has had on each generation and then how that financial impact will affect the purchases uh, in various categories for the future. So on a scale of five from very affected to improved, um, we do see that the majority of consumers have been at minimum somewhat unaffected uh, by the pandemic financially. Boomers, not surprisingly, have seen the most financial stability with 56% indicating their financial situation has not been affected or in some cases has actually improved. Uh, millennials span the widest range of being affected with most falling into those middle categories of not affected, somewhat unaffected, or somewhat affected. And Gen Z skews the highest in terms of negative impact with 76% of Gen Z indicating that they've been financially impacted in some way by the pandemic. Now, how will this financial impact affect each generation's purchases within specific categories like VMS, snacks and sweets, uh, weight management products, or even sports nutrition? Well, what we found was that boomers are more likely to spend more on VMS and spend less on snacks and sweets in the future. Gen X somewhat follows their lead in that respect. Millennials look to be pretty divided with some of the highest levels of consumers reporting that they're going to spend more in each of these categories, while at the same time, the highest levels of consumers saying that they're going to spend less. Um, and Gen Z looks to be pretty honest about the fact uh, that one third of them are going to spend more on vitamin and mineral supplements to support that immune system, but they're also going to be spending more on snacks and sweets, perhaps due to some kind of emotional response of this pandemic taking place at a young age. But across the board, more than a quarter of respondents from each generation indicate that they're going to spend more on VMS in the future. It's all about that immune system support. Um, but again, it's those millennials that we really need to watch as they have the highest levels of respondents who say that they're going to spend more in these certain categories. So next, we'll discuss the mini trends that we'll be updating in our building a lifestyle megatrend. And the premise of the building a lifestyle megatrend remains pretty solid. Consumers are increasingly aware that what's good for one person may not fit the needs of another. And for 2021, we'll dig into the clean label and better for you functional benefits and positively nutritious mini trends in this mega trend in order to better understand the impact of that COVID has had on these specific mini trends. When it comes to generational differences between what constitutes clean label and better for you, we, we see quite the divide. 43% uh, of boomers prefer to have foods and beverages made with simple, real ingredients, while 43% of Gen Z prefers to have something labeled as no something, no preservatives, no artificial ingredients, no high fructose corn syrup, or no trans fats. <clears throat> Older consumers are also more con concerned with moderating that macro intake, um, having their food and drinks that offer special health benefits, whereas younger consumers are more focused on authentic global flavors or using food and drink occasions to connect with other people socially, which they've obviously been missing over the past year. In 2021, we also find that the complementary dimensions of health and wellness are increasingly intertwined and kind of blurring this boundary. And consumers are well aware that this well-being extends beyond just treating surface level symptoms of illness in the physical body. So think, you know, taking ibuprofen for a headache. And the past year has really brought into focus the threads that connect certain dimensions of health and wellness. In particular, those links between the body and the mind, as well as personal and community health, and how vulnerable vulnerabilities in one area may put other areas at risk. So this line of thinking is more along the lines of finding the root cause of a symptom and taking the holistic approach to healing that root cause. In fact, we see that 82% of consumers agree that mental and emotional balance is just as important as physical health. 
COVID-19 experience has brought about a, a new emphasis on health and wellness for many consumers, which is likely to continue as many return to normal activities and kind of seek to reset the, their lifestyles as the spread of, of COVID-19 diminishes. Um, you know, manufacturers should anticipate sustained consumer interest in products that support generalized wellness, um, as well as more specific health needs as well. Um, snacks and products will be called on to deliver more for consumers in that regard. And with consumers wishing to combat negative health consequences of the pandemic, messaging that focuses on the health supporting aspects of these products will help garner attention and exploration from consumers. So, in fact, we're now actually seeing a higher number of consumers indicate that it's more about what a product doesn't have than what it does have. Consumers want products, especially snacks that are low in sugar, low in calories, low in salt, low in carbs. But there's also 32% of consumers that say positive nutrition is still very important. And they want to see products that are high in protein, made with good fats, or have added vitamins and minerals. And in 2021, it's all about positive nutrition and the avoidance of negatives. And because of specific groups, especially millennials and boomers or even parents, um, have a tendency to prioritize different attributes, manufacturers really need to consider how their products align with these different demographic variances. Last year, we discussed the Nutri-Score, uh, which is a score on the label of food and drink products that kind of scores the product based on its healthfulness. Um, but why are, we, why are we bringing it up again? Well, consumers are looking for easier ways to identify healthy products in order to avoid the onslaught of marketing messages on pack. And keep this in mind because we're going to be discussing this again um, a little bit later in the presentation. As discussed in our Generation Me megatrend, 73% uh, of consumers feel that immune system support or immune health will be important or very important to them in the future. And they'll be reaching for food and drinks to satisfy that need. But how do we know that, you might ask? Well, 49% of consumers currently turn to food management to help prevent a wide range of health conditions, with 61% of consumers using food as a remedy to treat or to prevent a specific health condition. You know, that could be something as simple as watching your sugar intake if you're diabetic, but it goes far beyond that. And knowing this, we can start to look at other benefits that consumers are looking to get from their food and drink products as well, and then develop those new products accordingly. So building on the increased importance of immune system support, consumers also claim an increasing importance on mental and emotional health due to COVID-19. Barriers to openness in this discussion that may have been in the past, um, it, you know, before the pandemic have pretty much been cracked wide open. Um, now we're seeing ads for app-based therapy and meditation tools, j even just when we're watching our favorite shows. Um, there's an ever-increasing number of public figures who are speaking out about their own mental health struggles and encouraging others to get the help that they need as well. Recently introduced products, things like um, Suja Organic Elevated Nutrients Immunity Strawberry Guava Beverage, that's a mouthful, has immune health supporting probiotics and vitamins, or there's Oat Mega's Protein Bar that actually has incorporated DHA omega-3s to support brain health. And these products have been introduced to kind of capitalize on consumers' pers pursuit of this healthy life in the midst of the pandemic and to kind of battle some of these things that they've been experiencing. Now, the one caveat with functional beverages is that consumers are so in need of relief that they're requiring more proof of efficacy during the decision-making process. So no longer are just simple claims like, it helps relieve stress. They're just not cutting it. Consumers want to see the proof. So developing new products with functional benefits that are backed by science and data is, is pretty paramount here. Next up, we're going to move on to the mini trends that we'll be discussing in our ultra personalization mega trend. So in ultra personalization, we'll be talking about the ways in which consumers' diets or ways of eating have been impacted by the pandemic as well as the shifting meaning of convenience. So when it comes to ways of eating, I don't think that any other mini trend has been more impacted in terms of personalization, especially. Um, every person has kind of dealt with the challenges of the pandemic differently when it comes to the way it's impacted their diet. And some are eating more, some are eating less. Some started choosing healthier snacks while others kind of succumbed to the allure of sweet and salty snacks at an arm's reach. 
Um, some people started cooking every meal at home while others just shifted to a dine out and delivery only model. Um, you know, due to COVID, we see that 25% of consumers who are working or studying at home have changed the way that they snack. But how are they changing the way that they snack? It may be somewhat surprising, uh, but the majority are actually seeking out more fresh fruits and vegetables and more nutritious snacks as well. Yes, there is still 27% of consumers who are seeking out uh, more sweet snacks. But I think what we're seeing in these late stages of the pandemic is the consumer response to their initial pandemic diets. They're realizing that they need to make some healthier choices in this kind of new normal that they're experiencing. But that's not the only way in which consumers' ways of eating have been impacted by COVID-19. Some have turned to food as a creative outlet, learning to cook or bake in their time spent at home, the great sourdough bread baking experience of 2020. Uh, food and drink has kind of become an outlet for escapism during the pandemic, a way for people to get out of their homes, and products that require some form of participation from consumers before consumption have become pretty common. So things like meal kits that let consumers explore far-reaching travel destinations right from their own home, those things provide not only a form of entertainment, but nourishment as well. Some are using experiences with food to connect back to easier times or times of comfort before the pandemic. Um, comes from a, a longing for what life looked like before. Food and drink brands can kind of help reconnect consumers with this pre-pandemic interest like travel or food service experiences. Restaurants did a really great job of pivoting to this takeout or delivery only model um, in order to give consumers that food service experience at home. And some have even started to use food as a signaling device is what they call it. So that's either wittingly or unwittingly they've done it. And it, that just means that they've started to use food as a way of expressing their personality in times of this limited social interaction or as a way of connecting to a wider community. So food and drink brands can work to, you know, become this signaling device to consumers, showcasing people's social status or their passions or their interests. Are you making coffee at home now and you've become kind of a coffee connoisseur in the process? I know a few of my friends have. Um, you know, what I tell them is you better have the right equipment and the highest quality beans in order to be that connoisseur. With many consumers working from home and social activities disrupted, Consumers have fewer places to go. They have the convenience of their kitchens and pantries within arm's reach, but with so much time already devoted to making meals, many consumers just don't have the drive to spend even more of their time preparing snacks as well. So that's why ease of consumption and preparation are still the top criteria consumers are using when they're choosing a snack. Portability is still important to some consumers, 22%, but not nearly as important as it was more than a year ago. And driven by those limited grocery store visits, consumers are planning ahead and stocking up on products that they know that they'll want and they know that they like instead of running out to buy something or buying something while they're out and about. Consumers aren't out and about anymore. Buying in bulk ensures that they always have a preferred snack on, on hand at home while they're also helping to save on uh, food expenses as well, buying in bulk. In 2021, convenience pretty much remains a top priority for many. It's just a different way of seeing convenience. And as people become more mobile and convenience and portability, they'll retain their prominence as top considerations. But manufacturers have to kind of continue asking what convenience means to their specific categories and those consumption contexts. Ultimately, we're seeing shifts in convenience towards uh, more hygienic in-store solutions like Amazon Go, where you don't have to touch anything but the products that you're purchasing. Um, but if the last year has pretty much taught us anything, it's that consumers increasingly want to see faster delivery times for products that they purchase online. Um, and one company, obviously, that's at the kind of at the forefront of this is Amazon. Um, when it comes to their Prime Now one hour delivery, or even when it comes to their Amazon Prime Air Drone delivery, that's currently in testing and development. So consumers are looking for safe, hygienic solutions for this post-pandemic world, but have also become accustomed to that ease of fast delivery. And no longer do they want to have to run out to the store for a last minute ingredient or a forgotten birthday present. Instead, they can order it online and have it to them within an hour. In-store experiences are, are becoming shorter and fewer. I'm sure that, you know, many of us, we've definitely cut back on our trips to the grocery store. Manufacturers have to connect with consumers where they are, which is more often than not 
not in the store. And utilizing technology in order to do that and connect with them on social media or online can create convenient kind of one-click purchase options to facilitate those impulse purchases. A great example of a brand utilizing that social media, <clears throat> sorry, social media impulse purchase facilitation is Goalie. So they're using an influencer's handle. They're running native ad campaigns for their new ashwagandha gummies. And on the ad, you see a shop now banner. And if you click the banner, the website pops up in Instagram. It doesn't take you to an external website. It pops up in Instagram. And by clicking order now, you select your package option and check out with PayPal. And effectively, you've ordered a five-month supply of Goalie's ashwagandha gummies in three clicks. What more can you ask for when, you, when you're talking about um, impulse, impulse purchases? Super easy. Next, we will discuss. Next, we'll discuss um, sustainability matters, and we'll be focusing on four of the six mini trends here. Full disclosure, hashtag activism, science and tech, and sleuthy shoppers. Oops. So, according to Mintel, the next winning combination will be create value with values. And this is the shift that we've seen in our mini trend, full disclosure. Now, consumers are asking, how are you making the world a better place? Brands that deliver value for money and operate responsibly will be the winners in this kind of new normal. COVID-19 has sensitized consumers to the needs of others, and consumers expect companies to be a part of that positive impact, not only on people, but on the planet as well. And these environmentally friendly programs are becoming more important as consumers demand action on climate change. These eco-friendly commitments can be, are, are becoming an expectation. And many consumers feel that if you're not actively promoting your eco-friendly programs, that you don't have any. A few great examples are Amazon's goal of 100% renewable energy for their operations by 2025, which is actually five years ahead of schedule for them, or United's commitment to investing in carbon capture technology, um, Amazon's also redeveloping their packaging strategies to be more eco-friendly as well, and introducing 100,000 electric delivery vehicles by 2030 in order to reduce their impact on carbon emissions. In addition to these expectations, we've also seen the introduction of the EcoScore, and that's similar to the NutriScore that rates products on their nutrition, but the EcoScore rates the products on their environmental impact. So what you see here are the criteria used to determine a product's eco score. Key environmental impacts like production, transportation, or packaging fabrication are used to provide a score out of 100. And then the product receives either additional points or points that are subtracted due to some of the additional criteria like uh, recyclability of the packaging, labels, um, the ingredient country of origin, or even seasonality of the ingredients as well. And these two things added together combined to give us the product's eco score. So here are a couple examples from the brand LaForche, which is an online market retailer. Um, they provide both the Nutri score and the eco score for all of their products. So here you're seeing their flower, which has a Nutri score of A and an eco score of A as well, meaning that it was most likely, uh, you know, grown close to where it's sold. And then you also see on the right-hand side their milk chocolate bar, which has a Nutri-Score of E, so obviously not the healthiest choice, and an Eco-Score of C. Although it is fair trade certified, those ingredients did have to travel quite a long way in order to be made into this chocolate bar. In our hashtag activism mini trend, in our next uh, mini trend in our sustainability mega trend, um, we're seeing a growing number of mainstream consumers that are concerned with visible sustainability issues like single-use plastic waste, and many are looking beyond the pandemic to the rising global crisis of climate change and global warming. And one of the most impactful ways that consumers are learning about brands and their, and their values is through platforms like social media. But again, brands have to kind of take the opportunity to connect with consumers where they are, which at this point is less often at the store or in front of a shelf. Uh, here we're seeing the, Gro the Grove Collaborative. So a lot of this information here is pulled directly from um, the Instagram pages of these, of these retailers. And the Globe, Grove Collaborative is an online retailer 
featuring all natural home, beauty, and personal care products, and focusing on sustainability and responsible sourcing. And they've made efforts to become plastic neutral, meaning that whenever you're buying something from them that uses plastic packaging, they remove that same amount of plastic from the ocean. So that means that in the last year, they've removed 5.3 million pounds of plastic from waterways. However, not just uh, they're not happy with just being plastic neutral. They're also pushing consumers to think about switching to sustainable alternatives that reduce or eliminate the plastic packaging altogether. And they're doing that by providing these eco-friendly alternatives and then advertising how many pounds of plastic could be eliminated by making that switch. So moving from single-use plastic Ziploc bags to things like um, the silicone bag, uh, sandwich baggies that are reusable, washable, and reusable. Nature Valley recently relaunched or recently launched their uh, redesigned granola bar packaging along with their marketing campaign about the fact that they're recyclable. And they're providing in store drop off recycling capabilities so that consumers can recycle the granola bar wrappers that they would normally just throw in the garbage. Unfortunately, it is a separate recycling stream, so consumers can't just put it in with their normal recycling, but they're providing an in-store drop-off so that they can increase the number of consumers that'll eventually recycle these bar packages. These are just a couple examples of brands that are making kind of the right changes. They're selling that story and being really vocal about their eco-friendly programs and products, but these are good examples to follow because 55% of consumers now expect brands to be a force for positive change and drive this fight against global warming forward, according to Mintel. Now, a lasting impact of the pandemic is the accelerated rise of online grocery shopping, I think. Uh, consumers of all ages have grown more accustomed to purchasing snacks and categories and groceries of all types via online interfaces. So, while many consumers enjoy shopping in person and may return to pre-pandemic sourcing patterns, in our science and tech mini trend, we expect many who have grown accustomed to this you know, new online shopping experience to continue leveraging those tools for at least a portion of their shopping needs. Another way in which science and tech is influencing sustainability is through the introduction of indoor vertical farms like Plenty. And we actually mentioned this idea last year but now it's actually coming to fruition, no pun intended, uh, through partnerships like Driscoll's and Plenty with the aim of expanding berry growing into regions that have historically been difficult to serve or access. So growing the fruit in closer proximity to these areas can help um, not only increase availability, but lower the retail price as well. Technology is also playing a more important role on the supplier side of the business. So farmers have access to apps that can help them track the health and growth of their crops. Um, that increases output and efficiency. And as we know, higher efficiencies for suppliers mean cost savings for them and ultimately lower prices for the end consumer as well. In our Sleuthy Shoppers mini trend, we find that more time at home and on social media has not necessarily garnered higher rates of trust for claims that are being made on social media. In fact, consumers are more likely to feel the need to validate claims made by social media outlets than they are when it comes to claims made by national news programs or on TV in general. According to FMCG Guru's sustainability survey, 49% of consumers say that they actually do additional research to validate ethical or environmental claims made by brands on social media most or all of the time. More traditional media sources like um, a national broadcasting service are slightly less likely to receive that kind of scrutiny with only 36% of consumers reporting that they perform additional research on the claims that are being made there. And our last mega trend is sensational. And this year we'll be focusing on two mini trends within the sensational mega trend: evoke emotion and the tactile experience. In Evoke Emotion, we'll explore the fact that the COVID-19 pandemic has brought about a heightened desire for nostalgic flavors and formats, particularly in snacks, as consumers look for those tried and true standbys in these kind of uncertain times. Um, but long-term trends and consumer preferences point to an ever-increasing desire among young consumers to experience new and more global flavors that bring about kind of a sense of discovery or delight. 
And in some markets, indulgent categories have, ca have recognized the importance of this emotional connection and have added on packed messaging about the potential feelings associated with a product as well. So as mental and emotional health become bigger priorities for consumers, more brands can share how their products resonate with mental and emotional well-being, and products can also make emotional connections through formulations and new ways of approaching product presentation or even consumption. A few great examples uh, utilizing this mental and emotional connection are brands like Juni that believes botanicals have the power to transform your health. They incorporate botanicals into, into their functional waters for uh, benefits like immunity or focus or calm. Uh, Recess has seen success with their drinks to quote unquote, help you feel calm, cool, and collected despite the stressful world around you. And Nor Organic, a skier, yogurt skier company, is incorporating lavender in their blueberry lavender skier to aid in digestion and calm stress. Another interesting trend that's made its way into the food and beverage world is that of ASMR, or Autonomous Sensory Meridian Response. What that is, it's, it's that tingling sensation that typically begins in the scalp and then moves down, you know, the back of your neck and into your upper spine. Generally, it's in response to an auditory or a visual cue. Um, social media has seen quite the range of ASMR content from paint mixing to soap cutting to food chewing. Um, and CPG brands are, are jumping on board here too. We see the Choco Mint from Pino is capitalizing on ASMR by including little mint granules in the chocolate coating of their frozen dessert. And of course, we probably all saw the Michelob Ultra um, commercial using ASMR to in the ASMR approach in their Super Bowl commercial. And that was with Zoe Kravitz, you know, whispering into a microphone and tapping her nails on the bottle and then opening the bottle with that shh from the from the carbonation. Foods and beverage, food and beverage products that consumers pretty much seem to love have a couple things in common, and that is that they're both have an emotional connection, but also have a sensorial experience. Now, for our tactile experience mini trend this year, we went in a completely different direction. <laughs> in fact, this mini trend is less about having a tactile experience and more about not having one. Uh, concerns regarding hygiene or worker shortages and worker interaction are really driving consumers to prefer less physical interaction with the outside world. And building off of the convenience and science and tech mini trends, we're seeing the introduction of solutions that address you know, many of consumers' current concerns. Uh, we see things like food delivery robots in restaurants, meaning consumers don't have to put themselves or even the servers and others at risk in order to get their food. Uh, we see food preparation robots in the back of the house, giving consumers peace of mind when it comes to hygienic preparation of their food. And according to FMCG Guru, 70% of consumers say that they'll only go to a restaurant where they can make a contactless payment transaction. Even 56% are looking for restaurants that can offer reassurance around the safe handling of food and drink. And I just have to say, I mean, what's safer than eliminating the human element altogether, pretty much? We're even seeing touchless grocery carts that circumvent this whole issue of having to sanitize your cart before grocery shopping so that you're only having to touch the products that you're purchasing and taking home with you. Now, in the spirit of providing a bit more COVID-specific data and information, we have a couple slides that uh, come from Glambia Nutritional's proprietary COVID-19 consumer tracking survey here for you. When it comes to our most recent survey data, we see that just over three quarters of the population say that they plan to get the COVID-19 vaccine or have already been vaccinated. And most of these people are just going to continue to live cautiously, but now with a little bit less concern and maybe a little bit more freedom. Now, the 23% of the population who do not plan to get the COVID-19 vaccine, for the most part, say that they'll just continue to live cautiously or will continue to social distance or wear a mask. There is a significant portion, however, that indicate that they never change their behavior to begin with or maybe don't believe in vaccines. And you'll see that strong number of respondents who selected other here as well, with the majority of those being um, open ended responses, essentially having to do with their distrust of this vaccine in particular, not all vaccines in general, but this one in particular, uh, most likely due to the accelerated testing and approval process. 
Now, before our last slide, we want to get a feel for how this audience may stack up to the general consumer. So we're going to launch a poll asking, when do you think it'll be safe to resume normal activities? And your options in the next few months, not before summer of 2021, not before the end of 2021, 2022 at the earliest, or never. So we'll give you a few moments here. There should be a pop-up that opens up and you're able to vote. Um, and we'll give you a few moments here to respond to the poll. And then what we'll do is we'll take a look at what the respondents of our proprietary COVID-19 consumer tracker said as well and see how we kind of stack up there. Moira, let me know when we've got a good response. Yep, I think we, we have a pretty good percentage of people who voted. Can you see the results now? Let's share the results. Ooh, I, hold on, and let me pull them up on my. So we have 27% that say in the next few months. Mm, okay. 17% not before summer of 2021. 28% say not before the end of 2021. And 24% 2022 at the earliest. And for really? me, never. <laughs> wow. Okay. Well, I can tell you this. We're we're a little bit, we're somewhat in line, but I think we're a little bit more conservative. Let's see how we uh, kind of stack up to the general consumer here. So uh, when we first launched the survey in Q1 of 2020, our response options obviously were a little bit different. You know, we still had in the next few months, but our other options were by the end of 2020 or 2021 at the earliest. So obviously those, those timelines have needed to shift as, we, as, we, as we've moved on here. Um, so now respondents see in the next few months, they see not before summer of 2021, as you all did, uh, not before the end of 2021 and 2022 at the earliest. The response for those last few are kind of clustered around that 20% mark. We're a little bit higher than that, actually, where, you know, 2022 at the earliest, I think, what'd you say, 24%. So that's about right. Um, so, you know, that last half of 2021 is where we think that's going to happen. Now, there actually is, has remained this somewhat consistent population who feels that the impact of COVID-19 will be a little bit longer term as well and perhaps never actually subside. It's hovered around five, four or five percent for the entirety of the time that we've been running this survey as well. So, you know, it looks like there's a little light at the end of the tunnel for a return to maybe a somewhat normal life. Um, and consumers, for the most part, are feeling feeling pretty good about it. So that is the end of our presentation today. We hope you uncovered, you know, maybe at least a few bits of information that you can take back to your business moving forward. And we really appreciate you for tuning in. Uh, we will be moving on to the Q&A part of the webinar, and that's where I'll be answering a few questions from the group. All right, great. Emily, that was awesome, as always. Great information. We do have a couple of questions. So um, the first one is some thoughts around consumer purchase behavior around single use plastics and recycled materials. Does sustainability inform purchase behavior in food? Yeah, so, well, that's a really good question. Um, you know, this goes back to our sustainability mega trend and we kind of covered off a little bit on this in terms of, you know, kind of telling your story in terms of eco-friendly. Amazon is working on their own packaging to make sure that they're um, easily recyclable and they're more economical as well. Um, I think some of the concerns came early on in the pandemic where, um, you know, concerns about hygiene were actually pushing consumers further towards single use plastics and, and single use products that maybe aren't as economical um, and environmentally friendly. And that was because for hygiene concerns, essentially, primarily. Um, as we've moved through the pandemic, what we're seeing is, you know, we thought that might have a longer term impact, but now we, we're kind of in these late stages of the pandemic and people have realized that they're not going to catch COVID by uh, touching a bottle that someone else has touched. Um, so primarily they're moving back away from these single use plastics and they're looking for these more environmentally friendly options when it comes to even things like restaurant takeout and delivery. Uh, if you're still using styrofoam and you're a restaurant, um, you're going to get dinged by consumers. Very good. And I just want to remind everyone they can use that um, Q&A box to ask questions if they have them while we're 
rolling here. Um, the next one is functional benefits. What are the product innovations related to immunity? Ah, uh, yes. Well, everyone is, immunity is the hot topic now. Um, and so what we're seeing in terms of products that are being launched, um, obviously very heavy in the VMS segment, um, in the supplement segment, um, everything is now that's being launched has immunity in some form. Um, what's really interesting though, when you look at food and beverages that are being launched with immune system support claims are, um, there are a lot of products that would normally have those benefits originally due to things like uh, vitamin C or vitamin D or even probiotics have become very popular in terms of immune system support as an ingredient. Um, so things like yogurt drinks that may not have had an immune system support claim on the label previously, if they're being launched now, they're making sure to incorporate that as, as a marketing message on the label because they know that it's of kind of the utmost concern for consumers right now. So we're seeing everything from BMS to um, tea, to protein bars, um, to uh, all kinds of different beverages that are now being launched with immune system support claims. And remember back to the Generation Me uh, megatrend where we're talking about the different types of products that consumers will want to be utilizing to support immune systems. Um, you know, everything from a fortified, you know, functional product, food or beverage, to things that are naturally high in an immune system supporting ingredient. So keep that in mind as well when you're you know, thinking about those generational differences. Terrific. I see a lot of questions here about a recording of this presentation. And yes, you'll be emailed a link to the recording on Monday afternoon. We'll be posting it on our website. Um, I have an interesting question here. Do you think that people will make their own snacks and bring them to work instead of buying them or bringing their own thermos with coffee, et cetera, instead of, you know, maybe buying coffee um, at the coffee shop? Should, should the food industry make the do-it-yourself snack kit or something like that to, to address those needs? That's a very good question. Um, you know, snacks, I would say maybe not so much. You know, that kind of goes along. Even now, people are not necessarily willing to be making snacks themselves. They're looking and reaching for those convenient kind of ready to go options, even when they're at home. Um, they're not even on the go that often anymore. But things like coffee, I think it is category dependent, but things like coffee, if you previously were purchasing your coffee at you know, let's say Dunkin' Donuts on your walk to the train or your walk to work every morning uh, before the pandemic. And then due to these external, you know, environment, you know, environmental impact, you've had to start making coffee at home. Well, as many of us probably know, it only takes 21 days to start a habit. And people have been doing this now for more like 21 months. Um, so I think that that is definitely going to be something that a lot of consumers now have seen the benefits and how easy it is to just, it's become part of their routine. Wake up in the morning, throw the, you know, coffee, a pot of coffee on and pour it into your cup to go and you're, you're ready to go. It's a cost saving measure, but also then keep in mind, they may have become coffee connoisseurs. And now, you know, that Dunkin' coffee isn't as alluring to them either. Um, so there will be changes in the way for some of these categories in the way that consumers interact with them moving forward. Yeah, I, I agree. I think, too, you know, some people have probably invested in coffee making equipment of some sort, too, yeah. and, and um, you know, invested in it by way of getting committed. Um, how has COVID changed consumers' values in regard to convenience and better for you products? Um, it has changed them quite readily. Um, I think you can see that in our convenience um, mini trend that we discussed, um, you know, earlier on in the presentation is that convenience means something a little bit different now. You know, it's not necessarily convenience to be on the go and something that they can take with them while they're moving. Um, but some of the same attributes still apply. You know, when I'm sitting at my desk and working from home, I still don't want a snack or a, something that I'm eating to be messy. You know, I still want it to be easy to eat while I'm doing something. Um, I still want it to be convenient. I don't want to have to take 15 minutes out of my day in order to prepare a snack, um, something that I can just grab while I'm working and, and consume while I'm working. So that's going to be how consumers are kind of interacting and engaging with convenience moving forward. Now, as they do return to life, I mean, you know, many consumers already have, there will then maintain, you know, that on the go mentality will kind of be brought back into life as well. So I, I don't think that 
um, we can discount this on the go convenience in totality. I think we maybe saw a little bit of a pause here, but we still want that um, you know convenience attribute to mean something that's readily available and doesn't take a lot of time pre to prepare and easy to easy to grab. Okay, awesome. Here's a good question for your uh, for you too. There's so much in the media right now about mental health currently. Do you see this category kind of segmenting into areas like um, students, men, you know, um, do you see segmentations for? Interesting. That's a really interesting question. Um, you know, there definitely could be. It kind of kind of would take the route of, I think, a lot of the trends that we've seen in the past where, um, you know, first we just see, you know, functional uh, functional products or functional nutrition or positive nutrition. Um, and that has kind of forked out into, well, it's a function for brain health. It's a function for immune system support. It's a function for um, eye health and eye support or muscle support. Um, so it could be similar. It could take that kind of similar path. Um, essentially, what's happening is is young people now are taking such an interest in their mental mental health and emotional health that it's no longer this taboo subject to talk about. And so now once we've kind of broken open those floodgates, you know, then they can get into, OK, well, I want, you know, a product or a service to mentally support me in this specific way. Um, and so it definitely could get that specific. It kind of goes along with this discussion that we've been having um, over the last year or so of this protein plus movement. You know, consumers no longer just want to see protein fortification. They want to see protein fortification plus something else, another benefit that's going to help them in some way. And that's that oat mega, um, you know, protein bar with DHA omega threes is a great example of that. So I, I see it kind of taking that same route where first you kind of have to open the conversation, then it will become more specific for each of the needs for consumers. Okay. Um, a couple more here. Do you think that the plant-based trend was accelerated by COVID or do you think it was just increasing anyway and independent of the pandemic? Hmm. Uh, well, so we did actually in our, in our uh, proprietary COVID consumer tracker, we, we did ask that question for a few month iterations, a few months of our survey um, on whether or not the, the pandemic had an impact on their consumption of plant-based products. Um, and we saw pretty steady responses of people, pretty much the majority of people saying it had no impact. Um, so I think it, the consumption and the increase in consumption of plant-based products was independent of and didn't have much of an impact by the, the pandemic itself. I mean, people weren't driven to plant-based products because of COVID. Um, now, that uh, there's a lot of things that could go into that as well. If there's a plant-based product that has an immune system support claim or a plant-based product that has um, a brain health support claim, that could be more of what's driving consumers to those products. Um, but I think it, the pandemic didn't have necessarily a direct impact on that increasing consumption of plant-based products. Uh, but now what we're seeing is people reaching for healthier products, so skewing towards you know fresh fruits and vegetables in terms of snacking. Um, and so that could definitely, you could definitely see an impact there in terms of that health-based um, you know, kind of marketing claims. Okay, good. Here's a, a question that I think a lot of people have had um, recently. What will be working from home's legacy in regards to protein supplementation via snacking? So what do you think the long-term impacts on that part of the industry is going to be? Well, uh, you know, over the past few months, I think all of us probably have gotten a little bit more clarity around what that future is going to look like in terms of working from home. Um, and from what it sounds like, and, you know, people that I've spoken with, it sounds like the majority of companies, they, they're they not going fully remote working. That's just probably not within the, the realm of reality. Um, but a more blended kind of schedule is something that um, I've been hearing a lot of from a lot of different companies. So just more flexibility when it comes to your ability to work from home, be in the office a few days a week, work from home a few days a week. Um, now, the impact that that's going to have on uh, protein fortified products or protein fortified snacks, um, I think is really kind of to be seen. There's a lot of different ways that that could go with that flexibility and a lack of commute on some days. People may take that opportunity to head back to the gym or get their workout in early or you know, to kind of take advantage of that. And so then that's going to be increasing consumption of 
um, those protein fortified products that they're relying on to support that activity. Um, on the flip side, I mean, you know, you're on the go, maybe that might actually a return to work may actually also have a positive impact on those of people that are using a protein shake as a, a meal replacement for lunch or a protein bar as a meal replacement or a snack in the afternoon, you know, when they're at the office, it's easy. Again, that's bringing back that on the go convenience mentality of these products where they're able to throw it in their briefcase, um, you know, quickly consume it at their desk at work. So there's a, a couple different ways. I think that this working from home or return to work mentality and, and schedule can kind of impact the category. Yeah. Great, great insight there. Thank you. Um, one, one more question. Um, how would a change in the demand of traditional versus natural vitamins and minerals and protein ingredients for new functional products? How would change? Let's see. Maybe, maybe the question is really, I'm just looking at it here. Um, do you see a change in demand for traditional versus natural vitamin and mineral protein ingredients? So I guess natural sources versus maybe some of the synthetic vitamins or um, that, that's my interpretation of it anyway. <laughs> well, <laughs> well it's your um, interpretation. <laughs> Kendi's interpretation as well. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, that's actually, it is actually a pretty interesting question because as consumers become more educated about those ingredients that are in the products that they're consuming, so say it's a fortified you know, immune system support beverage. Um, as they become more inquisitive about the ingredients that, well, what ingredients in here are supporting my immune system? Um, then they're going to become more educated on those ingredients, but also then more inquisitive about the sourcing. Well, where did this ingredient come from? And a good example of that would be something like um, the sources of omega-3s. So when you're putting omega-3s into a product, a protein bar, um, you know, a functional beverage or something like that, um, consumers are going to start becoming more inquisitive about where those omega threes were coming from, and I think a great a, the divide there for that um, ingredient specifically is plant based versus like a fish oil based omega three. Um, and so, when consumers become aware of that, then you may see some demand, an increasing demand for maybe like a plant based um, a plant based source of omega threes over something like a fish oil. Now, if there's a difference between the two and you have really, you know, strong science backing and supporting it, that goes back to that functional, functional um, ingredients and um, mini trend that we had where they want to see the science behind it. So at the end of the day, it's maybe not necessarily about um, natural versus, um, you know, whatever we were saying, normal versus natural, but um, it is more about the, the efficacy as well. So if you can prove that, you know, even if it's not a necessarily an inherent ingredient in it, but you're adding an ingredient to a product and it's very effective um, and you market it that way, that will gain the attention of consumers. Fantastic. I think, you know, we've run over, but we have a lot of good questions and um, we still have a lot of people hanging in there with us. So I just wanted to um, close, of course, by thanking Emily for the fantastic um, presentation and all the great information. And also as a reminder to everyone that um, at the end of this webinar, you'll be getting a survey from us and um, please give us your feedback. It helps us make the next webinar better, you know? So please, you know, continue to share your ideas and thoughts with us. Also, you'll get a couple of follow-up emails with a link to the recording of the webinar, and um, you'll get our, our contact information that way as well. And I encourage you, if we didn't answer a question um, that you're still interested in or you want more information from us, please you know, reach out to us. We're, we're here for you to answer those questions and provide you with more information. Um, and... Um, Again, there's a lot of great content on our Nutri Knowledge section. So if you want to dive deeper into any of these areas, there's content there and we'll be publishing content um, over the next month or so on the megatrends as well. So um, we'll keep you informed as we have new stuff coming out, but um, also keep an eye on that section. And thank you, Emily, for this fantastic presentation. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> As always, the time flew. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Thank you.